Good evening, everyone. This is the Municipality of Anchorage Planning and Zoning Commission, September 16, 2013. Uh, may I have the roll call, please? Ms. Yoshimura? Here. Ms. Dean? Mr. Parks? Here. Mr. Pruz? Here. Mr. Mulcahy? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Ferguson? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Spring? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. There are no minutes, so we're moving on to the special order of business. Vice Chair Parks, will you please do the disclosures? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Pruz? Uh, in the case of 2013-068, uh, 2013-069, it's, it's uh, become aware that uh, I've actually got two small leases with the petitioner on a monthly basis on a state highway project I'm doing on Eagle River. Okay, do you see that this would uh, uh, have a conflict with your ability to make a decision on this case? On these cases, excuse me? I will, I will leave that up to the commission to decide. Okay, and what's the will of the commission? Gonna move? Okay. Tyler? Um, could you, th these particular um, leases, could you go in, does it have to do with the land that's, that's the subject parcels of those cases? Uh, I don't know about the master plan, but, but it's up uh, Eagle River Road towards the, uh, the last six miles towards the visitor center. And there are small parcels we're using for lay down for culverts and construction equipment on a month-to-month -month basis so so it, it has nothing to do with the monofill or or anything like that but it is at least from the petitioner are you looking for my yes opinion I, I, I would direct uh, Commissioner Cruz to participate okay and I think that's unanimous that you should participate madam chair uh, yes, um, I do have a couple of disclosures in um, the case of the uh, Eklutna-068 and uh, 069106, and uh, I wish to disclose that I have upon occasion um, listed and sold uh, property um, with Eklutna. Um, I am not a party to uh, any of the cases that are currently before us. I have also previously disclosed that as far as the rezone is concerned that um, I have uh, a relationship with Hulquist Homes. Um, that is a long-standing relationship and I do believe that they are a party to this transaction but um, I am not financially involved in the uh, matter. Okay. And I believe uh, and all other cases in this that we've heard that we have asked you to participate. Right. Um, I do have one other disclosure to make, um, which is in the uh, uh, case 2013-129, the Municipality of Anchorage, the current Planning Community Development Department and Ordinance of Title 21 by the Planning and Zoning Commission, which has to do with the rural lighting standard for which um, I do have a, uh, uh, a financial interest in. So I would ask to be recused. And I think that's appropriate. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Commissioner Robinson. Uh, yes, in, in the matter of case 2013-121, uh, I would like to disclose that um, my company, with um, me acting on behalf of my company, have um, a current uh, purchase and sale agreement of a property, uh, not the subject property, but with the petitioner. And we've recently re-entered into negotiations to uh, broaden that scope and potentially add additional land and monetary value to that, to that purchase agreement. Um, I believe the timing of that situation is such that it um, certainly has the, the appearance of a conflict, if, if nothing else. And uh, I believe I'd like to be recused from acting in that case. Well, I think that would be appropriate if that's the way you feel. And uh, 
that would cause an issue with that particular case, uh, Madam Chair, because we would be on a short board and we probably ought to give the petitioner the opportunity when it comes, uh, when we come out of this uh, disclosure to uh, postpone if he would like. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Uh, uh, matter of 2013-114, I have previously uh, disclosed a working relationship with the uh, applicant's representative that's ongoing. I don't believe it impacts this. It has nothing to do with this particular project. And I think in other cases we've asked you to participate. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. That's right. Commissioner McKay? Uh, just a reminder that for case 2013068 and 2013069, I have previously been directed by the board to not participate in those. However, um, and then at 2013106, then the only disclosure is that about five years ago I used to be an employee of Eklutna and no continued ties. So you will be uh, recluding yourself from case 69 and 68, is that correct? Thank you. And I, and I have no conflicts, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we are now um, moving on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion for approval for 2013-031 that has been revised on case 2013-087? Uh, Commissioner Parks, move for approval, seconded by Commissioner Ferguson. Is there any objection? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. Thank you. That resolution is approved. Um, <clears throat> at this particular point in time, we have a couple of items that we need to address. The first one um, has to do with case 2013-121. Um, it has uh, been brought to uh, the attention of the Planning and Zoning Commission that um, you are faced with a short board um, that gives you the right to extend to the next available uh, meeting um, without uh, any uh, additional fees. Um, is the petitioner's representative here? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm Gary Spring, uh, standing in for Matt Bobich. I uh, was the architect for the project. Would you come up here? And I'm Rebecca Wynn, attending on behalf of Northern Lights Center, and we'd like to proceed tonight, if possible. All right. Thank you very much. That'll be fine. All right. Thank you. All right. And then um, Ms. McConnell on case 2013-129, uh, um, the petitioners, the municipality of Anchorage, um, I, do I understand correctly that um, the municipality would like to postpone? until the October meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have re received a request from one of the Assembly members sponsoring the ordinance, Assembly Member Trombley, who does request that it be postponed to the next meeting, which would be October 7th, due to the fact that some expert individuals would not be able to attend the meeting tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Um, what is the wish of the Commission? Commissioner Parks. Uh, Madam Chair, I make a motion that we postpone case number 2013129 to the next available date. All right, that's been seconded by Commissioner Ferguson. Is there any objection? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. That case is now postponed to October 7th. All right, we are moving on to public hearings. This is case 2013-106. The petitioner is Eklutna, Inc. This is a rezoning to more than one zoning district. May we have uh, the uh, staff presentation, please? Excuse Thank me, you. Madam Chair. Yes? Um, there has been no uh, postponement action taken on the unfinished business. Um, while the petitioner did indicate last meeting that he did wish to postpone, there has been no postponement motion. Ah, all right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. May I have a motion for postponement? Commissioner Parks? I'd like to make a motion that we postpone case number 2013-068 until the next meeting, uh, 10 7, or I guess it would be 10 7, yes, 10 7 13. That's 068 and 069. Do you want to do both, Terry? Yeah. Yes, we do yeah. them both. I'm sorry, 68 or 6, 8 and 69. All right. Okay, very, very good. Um, that's been seconded by Commissioner Pruse. Is there any objection to the motion? All right, seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. All right, so we have rearranged our agenda. And we're now moving on to 
uh, case uh, 2013-106. Now may we have the presentation by staff. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the proposed rezoning to B3 I1SL and I2SL will expand the existing industrial area near the Eklutna interchange. And the 2009 um, Anchorage Industrial Land Assessment finds that there will be, uh, that there is a shortage of vacant industrial zone property to meet demand through 2030. With this re rezone request, the department is concurrently processing uh, an amendment to the 2006 Chugach Eagle River Comprehensive uh, Plan land use map. The property uh, that is the subject of this rezoning meets the locational criteria of uh, industrial land uses in the 2006 uh, Chugach Eagle River Comprehensive Plan. The petition site abuts or is in the vicinity of existing industrial uses and in zoning. Um, there is sufficient land area within the petition site for industrial uses, and there are paved roads um, all the way to the Glen Highway. These parcels are not likely to be developed for residential uses because of existing industrial zone parcels that include the MEA power plant, which is zoned I2SL, and the water bottling plant, which is zoned I1SL, also a rezone um, to I-2 of the village's south subdivision, Tract 1, and the Clutena Acres subdivision, Lots 1 through 7, also known as the Harry Johnson property, um, is uh, pending approval by the Assembly. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's dated. Um, uh, it was approved by the Assembly, the rezoning. I apologize. Um, uh, finally, the tract abutting the MEA power plant has, uh, has uh, temporary use approval as a laydown yard. Uh, the proposed rezoning appears to benefit the public by providing new industrial land with easy access to the Glen Highway. Um, within your packets, uh, page 9 has a draft ordinance um, for the rezoning, and page 12 has an exhibit which shows the, the areas uh, uh, that are subject to this rezone. Um, be happy to answer any questions, and the petitioner is here also to give a presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions? from staff at this particular point in time. All right. Um, I forgot to read um, the procedure by which the public may speak to the commission at its meetings. One, after the pres staff presentation is completed on public hearings, the chair will ask for public testimony on the issue. Persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the commission rules of procedure. A, petitioners, including all his or her representatives, 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved for rebuttal. B, representatives of groups, community PTAs, five minutes. C, individuals, three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. An individual may have appeal rights relating to any action the Planning and Zoning Commission takes, except commission recommendations to the assembly, which are not appealable. Appeals must be filed with the clerk's office within 20 days after approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission of the resolution, which is the commission's final decision. A fee for the appeal is required at the time of filing. Any individual may request written findings from any commission decision within seven days. Um, I would also request that when um, public testimony is given that we are respectful of the person that is speaking and we refa refrain from uh, any um, comments uh, from the audience during that period of time. So, um, do we have the petitioner's representative here? Would you please? Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, I apologize. Okay. I, um, we had discussed the possibility of um, running these uh, public hearings for these two cases jointly from the problem we had before. Uh, the size of the crowd, it may not be as important as it was a couple weeks ago. Um, what is the wish of the commission at this time? Commissioner Robinson. Uh, Madam Chair, since the second um, case is simply processing uh, sort of a cleanup, I, I would believe that aggregating the um, public hearing, I, I would support a motion to aggregate the public hearing. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that is a motion. Commissioner Robinson. Yes, it is. All right. Thank you. May I have a second? Commissioner Ferguson, are you on board with that? Uh, but he's got to hit motion first. All right. All right. Very good. That doubles the amount of time available uh, to the uh, 
Ms. McConnell. I apologize for the interruption, Madam Chair, but considering that you are going to hold the public hearing on both of these cases together, perhaps could we have the staff report on the second case before the public speaks? Excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you. Please proceed with the staff report. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Case 2013-114 is an amendment to the Chugach Eagle River Comprehensive Plan. It will modify the land use plan map of the Chugach Eagle River Plan by changing the land use classifications for an area along the south side of Glen Highway and Alaska Railroad Corridor across from Chugach, uh, across from Aklutna Village. The change will, to the map will reclassify this area from low density residential and commercial designations to industrial and community facility. The amendment to the plan is limited to the geographic area identified in attachment A to the case report. Attachments B and C provide the proposed amended land use plan map. That's attachment B. Attachment C is the existing land use plan map. Attachment D is a vicinity aerial image map. Attachment E indicates that in response to public notice sent by July 22nd, no comments were received by the public from the public. Uh, the amendment is concurrent with and requisite to case 2013-106, the rezoning. However, it also reflects recent past land use decisions in other areas in the immediate vicinity, including approved changes in use from zoning and a new public facility lo uh, location. This map, uh, this plan map amendment reflects these adjacent rezonings, these previous adjacent rezonings to industrial, as well as a site plan approved for a new power generation plant. The Chugach Eagle River land use plan map is intended to be updated as new public facilities like this power plant uh, are planned, and it does provide the community facility land use classification for this kind of use. Accordingly, the proposed land use plan map amendment reclassifies the new MEA power plant, power generation plant site as community facility. The land use plan's industrial use classification is intended to provide areas for future industrial development. The goals of the plan prescribe an adequate supply of suitable land for commercial, residential, industrial development. Several recent land studies lend analytical support to reclassification of the commercial and residential designated areas in the existing land use plan map to industrial in the proposed amendment area. area. The studies forecast a continued surplus of buildable commercial land in Chugach Eagle River and in the municipality overall, and an insufficiency of buildable industrial land to meet demand through 2030. For residential, a surplus of land designated for large lot single family is forecast. Uh, this is the existing uh, land use plan map designation in the area for residential. The planning division recommends approval of the amendment to the Chugach Eagle River Comprehensive Plan to reflect the revised land use classification boundaries and cosmetic map improvements depicted in attachment B. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Robinson, you have a question. I do. Um, question for staff. I, I, I understand why you are calling the power plant community facility, but when I look at a land use plan map and I, I see community facility, I often, first thing that I generally think about is a school or an administrative building or something like that that I think is very different from a, from a power plant. Is there, is there any distinction that you make in the land use plan maps to sort of call that out to, to maybe it's an academic question more than anything, but you know, is there a reason why you can't call that industrial or shouldn't call it industrial since it is, its use is very industrial in nature even though the ownership is, is different? Uh, yes, through the chair, the community facility designation in the land use plan map for Chugach Eagle River is specifically designed to cover 
both instances. I know in the bowl, for example, the land use plan map provides a more of a community, school, institutional, institutional use versus the, you know, the public facility use. However, in the Chugach Eagle River Comprehensive Plan, the land use plan map section specifically includes both in community facility. And it also, uh, it, it also reads specifically that as new public facilities, including public utility facilities, are planned um, and, and their sites are identified, that in fact the community facility uh, use designation is the designation that uh, is intended to be used. And you will find on the plan map, for example, just to the, uh, uh, just to the east of this site, you will find the, the, uh, uh, the water plant, for example, the existing water plant site uh, designated community facility. And it's just a, a, a characteristic or quirk in the uh, Chugiak River, Eagle River Comprehensive Plan map uh, specifically. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions of staff at this time? All right, um, we'd like to hear from the petitioner's representative. Please come forward at this time. You have 20 minutes, Mr. Dreyer. Uh. Oh, yes. And you have already used up one minute. <laughs> Madam Chair, yes. members of the commission, <laughs> planning staff, members of the public, my name is Tom Dreher and I'm with the S4 group. And I represent the petitioners tonight, uh, Jim Arneson and Greg McDonald with uh, Clutena Inc. are here tonight also to answer any questions you may have of them. <clears throat> Um, the handouts were just, it was a, uh, one's a letter of support from Alaska Water and the other one is just a map that you have on your page 22 that came off kind of dull in the printing. And so I just, it's exactly the same map, it's a little brighter and easier to read. And I'd like to reserve 14 minutes for rebuttal. The first map I'd like to start off referring to is the one that's on your packet page 12. It shows a little more of the surrounding area than <clears throat> my map does that I, that's on your other page 22. The existing industrial uses as stated by staff is, and uh, to the southeast in the area on page 12 that says PLI, that's the $200 million or so Clutena water treatment facility. And then to the east of this area, you have a 70 acre MEA power plant that's being built, a $300 million plant. And I don't know if the commission has had a chance to go out there and take their tour. They will give you a little tour on this little tut tut. It's an incredible operation out there. The, just a huge building and six power generator units that are about 100 feet long and 20 feet tall. It's really quite the operation. And it's also kind of amazing to think that just with those two developments and a few that we're proposing here, there's over half a billion dollars of work going on out there. That's quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> and now we can switch to the map that's on your page 22. Well, the, the one I just handed out that's a little clearer to read That area that's labeled B, it's kind of off orange. That's the MEA temporary laydown yard. That area has been mostly cleared and it's being utilized for the construction of the, of the uh, power plant. Our proposed industrial uses, you can see on this map, area C is the expansion area for Alaska glacier products. Their existing facility just right to the west of there, kind of right where it says that F in that square there. The area A that's just right north of what we call area C there is there's planned a new truss plant 
probably about a $5 million project. They are planning on having 15 to 20 employees there on a continuous basis. That's the Alaska Trust Inc. <clears throat> area, area B is the area for ex expansion for MEA facilities between, I keep hearing a beep, I don't know if that's, okay. We're having a technical difficulty. I think you've spoken for about three minutes. Okay, yeah. All I, right. Okay, so, <clears throat> and that area will connect in. It just makes good sense because we have I-2 to the east there, and then we have what everybody's calling the Harry Johnson, which is the blue area to the west, which is uh, zoned I-2, so we have a, a continuous piece there. Uh, uh, area uh, D, see which is further to the southwest there, is between the Glen Highway and the Old Glen Highway. And that is just, that area is, is for general industrial expansion. Some of the salient features, <laughs> some of the salient features of this is, A, it's adjacent to a major Glen Highway intersection, and it's adjacent to the Alaska Railroad. If you look on the, the bigger maps, I think there's one in here somewhere that you go all the way back to Anchorage and never do the Twain meet until you get right here. That's so a very powerful. Testing. Testing. Here we go. Okay. There you are. All right. <laughs> And, of course, uh, the other salient feature is that it's adjacent to the existing industrial uses. It sits on uh, incredibly excellent ground for building. It's basically a gravel pit quality type of area. It complies with all the Chugach Eagle River comp plan, um, commercial and industrial goals on page 41 of the plan, where it speaks to the objectives and the strategies. Fulfills the need for industrially zoned properties outlined in the 2009, <clears throat> excuse me, Anchorage Industrial Land Assessment Report. And it also helps replace land that essentially has been removed from developable industrial land just north of the Klutna Village, and that's shown on um, that map that's on page 12. You can see that area up there, north of the village the area that's zone I2SL. And, unlike my last case I had up here, I had the support and non-objection from MOA planning staff, the Chugach Community Council, and the Klutna Community Council. And it complies with new Title 2110, which is Chugach Eagle River, 2110-040E, which is on page 567 of the code, as it's currently paginated. And with that, um, I'll make myself available for any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. You are going to have about 14 minutes left for your rebuttal. Um, and do we have questions? Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the map, and I'm looking primarily at Area C. Could, could you describe where, where access will be for that, for that area? The access for Area C is along the north property line. Uh, there's an existing paved road that goes most of the way there. And the area, the line between the area B and C, that, that's actually an existing road that goes into the power plant area. And so the southern portion of the, of the tract where, it, where it's adjacent to uh, undeveloped R10, mm -hmm. um, and it looks like there might mm. be a creek or something flowing back there, there how far... Understanding that that R10 is very raw and, and, and large lot, um, mm -hmm. but what would what would the likely interface be between that southern boundary and, and the R10? The terrain on the south there goes up pretty steeply, and if there's any future development, it would probably end up coming more off of the existing road that goes up to Klutna Lake there. You can see it's it's not labeled on that map on page 22, but you can um, see that there's just like a gray line there. Okay. 
kind of just east of Area D. I mean, would, wouldn't you agree that that um, it, it's normally unusual to see industrial land next to rural zoned residential land, but it, but in this case, it appears there may be some geographic barriers that really don't make them as closely connected as it as it appears just on a two-dimensional map. Yeah, correct. There's there's a pretty a pretty good slope back there. It goes from 40, 35 percent, and 10 percent or so. Great. And, and then there's normally, I think it's in code, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was a 50-foot buffer zone between an industrial zone and a residential zone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? I don't see or hear any other questions, so we'll now open the hearing to the public. Is there anyone here who wishes to testify? Would you please come forward? Madam Chairman, members of the board, I was just excited about having six minutes to talk to you, but I really won't use six minutes. Um, my name is Tim Potter with Dow HKM. I'm here tonight just speaking on my own behalf, however, um, just due to familiarity with the area. First off, I'd uh, recommend that you support the rezone, uh, and, the, and, and mostly because of the following attributes. Um, there is a highway interchange. There's actually two highway Mr. Potter, what is your relationship to Eklutna? I mean, I think... On this specific case? Yes. Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Proceed. I'm not getting paid. Mark that down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm trying to help you out. Okay. okay. All right. Um, boy, that got me all off, didn't it? <clears throat> Yeah, it was a harsh reality of that. Um, <laughs> there's actually a, a significant highway interchange uh, there at Eklutna. There's also a highway off-ramp that goes to the old Glen Highway uh, that goes on uh, the back side of what's being proposed to go to B3SL and um, to the I1SL, um, which is appropriate. So there's actually multiple ways to get from and to the highway uh, from this uh, proposed area. There is good road infrastructure. I know that was a question that uh, uh, Mr. Robinson just asked. Um, there is frontage on the Alaska Railroad, uh, which is a main line. There are uh, discussions about straightening out that portion of the line as it goes behind the rock knob at the Kinnick uh, River. That would accommodate the potential for a siding or two at that location, which is also uh, very important for an industrially zoned area. It's relatively flat, and what was indicated earlier from a geotech standpoint, the area is primarily um, good soils and gravel, uh, which would promote um, uh, less um, costly development for industrial development. Uh, there is the new MEA power plant. Uh, what's primarily exciting about that is not only do we have a, a brand new $200 million facility and all the things that go with it, um, but there are opportunities that spin off of that. These are, uh, this is not a jet turbine uh, power plant. These are reciprocating engines that are um, from Finland, uh, are still very efficient, but they do create a little bit more heat, uh, and they do have a heat load um, that can be utilized for a variety of spin off other opportunities. That goes towards manufacturing. Uh, we've had long-term discussions in the broad perspective as part of the uh, updating of uh, Eklutna River, uh, working with the uh, Tribal Council, that a hatchery may be a possibility to try and restock and rehabilitate uh, the salmon runs in the Eklutna River. Um, sustainable agriculture, I know there's been discussion about the Chugach Electric and the MLMP plants having uh, agricultural components uh, and greenhouses. This is another opportunity for year-round sustainable agricultural projects uh, to occur within greenhouses or separate structures. That means jobs, 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 which are important to all of us. It's very important to the shareholders of Eklutna, 
and it's uh, it's a potential way to reduce the amount of uh, commuting that does occur because there'll be a core group of jobs uh, in this op in this area that can be available for local residents as well as Matsu residents. Um, that's about all I have. I just recommend your support. All right. Thank you very much for your public testimony. Thank you. All right. Would the next person please come forward? Is there anyone else here who wishes to testify on these two cases? All right. Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is now closed. Mr. Dreyer, do you have any other additional comments that you'd like to make? Uh, no, I'll just make, I'll make myself available for any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any questions of uh, Commissioner Mulcahy? Hey, just a quick question. I uh, had an opportunity to go over the uh, staff recommendations as well as the proposed language for the ordinance. Any questions, concerns, comments on those? Uh, no, we're fine with that. We reviewed it. We've worked back and forth quite a bit on that. Yeah, it's fine. All right, thank you very much. The public mm -hmm. hearing is closed. Uh, our, what is the wish of the commission? May I have a motion? Commissioner Mulcahy. Madam Chair, I move to approve case 2013106 and what do one at a time or should we do both? Um, I think we do them together. Let's, let's move to approve 2013106 and right. where'd it go? 2013114, correct? Right. right. Can we do that, Erica? Since we had the public hearing, Madam Chair, I recommend you move you approve them one at a time. All right, All right. I thank will you very move much. Move to approve two zero one three one zero six. All right, and seconded by Commissioner Robinson. Any objection? No. Seeing and hearing none, that is approved. All right. Next, Madam Chair. Yes. If I may, I'd like to add a few findings of fact. All right. Um, in, the, in the matter of case uh, 2013106, uh, I supported this, um, this request for a rezone, recommendation to the Assembly for a rezone for a couple of reasons. One, um, it is adjacent, the land is adjacent to uh, new industrial uses, some of which have been recently rezoned. I think that um, it is also consistent with the shortage of industrial land as stated in the industrial land assessment study of 2009 and so opportunities to find new industrial land within the municipality is always uh, a good thing. Uh, I think that uh, with the companion case from the planning department, their analysis uh, and recommendation to adapt the uh, land use plan map uh, does also, uh, I think, lead me to believe that it's it's consistent with the Chugiak Eagle River comprehensive plan. And uh, I think as we heard in testimony, there's also some uh, potential symbiotic relationships of this parcel to uh, other uh, industrial land in the area. All right, thank you very much for those findings of facts. Any other comments? All right, thank you very much. We're now on to case 2013-114. May I have a motion, please? Commissioner Mulcahy. Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve 2013114. All right, may I have a second, please? Seconded by Commissioner Ferguson. Is there uh, any discussion, any uh, issue? So, yeah. Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved, but may we have some findings to accompany it? Thank you. Commissioner Mulcahy, findings? Yes. Get your packet back up. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, thanks that it uh, applies with the comprehensive, that you get Eagle River comprehensive plan updates consistent with that and that it is um, consistent with the findings of fact from the previous one, that it, uh, uh, the shortage of industrial land and the proximity to um, development of additional industrial opportunities and jobs, jobs, jobs. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. We are now moving on to case 2013-121. The petitioner is the Northern Lights Center, LLC. May we have the staff presentation? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The Northern Lights Center. Um, oh. oh, wait. 
There's the site plan on page uh, 10 of your packet, and uh, the next page, page 11, shows an as-built to the property. It's a little tough to read, but you'll see that there are some of the lots are a little um, darker than the others, and that's where the existing uh, mat-made building sits. Uh, the petitioner requests uh, site plan approval of a self-storage facility in the B3 district. The petition site consists of 1.42 acres and is known as the Matanuska Made Building. The property is located between West Northern Lights Boulevard and West Benson Boulevard and is west of North Star Street. The building was built prior to the general area-wide uh, rezoning in 1971. Uh, page 40 has the non-conforming rights, legally non-conforming rights, um, uh, establishment uh, letter. Um, the site plan shows 86 uh, heated indoor self-storage units and an administrative office. Uh, the parking space deficit would be reduced from 61 spaces to 57 spaces. The site plan shows uh, minimal new landscaping because additional landscaping would further reduce um, the number of uh, parking spaces provided. Um, no outdoor vehicle storage is being proposed with this uh, site plan. The site is currently operating as a self-storage facility and has been since 2009 without this approval. Um, this was discovered by the Building Safety Division when the owner applied for an electrical permit for a new uh, sign in February of this year. Uh, the department is recommending approval uh, for uh, the site plan as provided by the petitioner, uh, subject to conditions one through six on page nine of the packet. Um, these are mostly standard uh, conditions of approval for our public uh, self-storage uh, facility. Um, uh, condition number three is submit to planning a copy of the storage rental agreement verifying hazardous materials and other prohibited activities are not permitted. Um, condition four, resolve with the traffic engineer the need to make the site universally accessible and provide any site plan uh, revisions to planning. Um, condition five, resolve with DOT the need to provide site distance, tri site distance triangles for access points onto West Northern Lights Boulevard and that the landscaping conforms to those uh, site requirements, uh, provide any site plan revisions to planning. And then uh, six, all proposed landscaping, um, and there's not a lot proposed, would be uh, installed no later than uh, next summer, June, June 1st. Uh, be happy to answer any questions. The petitioner is here as well. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. Are there any questions from? Uh the commissioner's trying to work my. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, on uh, recommendation number four, the language universally accessible is new language to me. Is that defined? Yeah, it just means handicapped. And we don't say handicapped spaces anymore. We say universally accessible. But it is universally I understand what the intent is. I'm not disagreeing with the intent. Is the term universally accessible defined in our in our ordinances? Um, we've uh, all communities have replaced um, the word handicapped with universally accessible. Um, I don't know that universally accessible is stated in Title 21, but uh, um, it's it's a generally accepted. Uh, the the old term is outdated. I'm cautious to insert a new term, even though that may be what the direction everybody's want to go before it's defined. No, sir. Um, Mr. Ferguson, um, I, the, the traffic department has used this terminology for a long time. I, I don't know what year they started um, using it, um, but uh, this is the term um, to describe uh, handicap accessible. I'm not totally. It's going to be in Webster's soon. <laughs> but I, I, we're requiring it today, and it's not defined today. That's my problem. Going on, I've got a little bit of trouble with the June 1st date with landscaping. We could still have frozen ground in May. The staff have a problem if we move that to July 1st, 2014. Um, through the chair, Mr. Ferguson, uh, planning has no uh, problem with that change. I recognize the amount of landscaping is very small, but when we put something down, I intend that the applicant will follow it, and I want to give them a reasonable chance to comply with that. No further questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? 
of staff. All right, we can hear now for the petitioner's representative. You have 10 minutes, and if you'd like to save some time for a rebuttal, please do so at this time. Oh, I don't think I'll need a rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Gary Spring, and I'm an architect. I'm representing uh, Matt Bobich for Northern Lights uh, Center. And um, really, I have very little to add to the staff presentation. Uh, except that uh, without any, without equivocation, uh, we have no problem with, with any of the, c the conditions for, for approval. Uh, in fact, the, <clears throat> the accessibility to the building is, the ramp just doesn't show very well on that, the scale of that drawing. It's, there's a ramp that goes to the main entrance, um, and we'll uh, make sure that the, that the parking the parking spaces get or is this thing yes it's on okay we'll make sure the parking gets uh, striped properly and and marked um, and then uh, that basically is ac gives access to the whole building so and then uh, and and <clears throat> It was, uh, I think, Mr. Ferguson was saying that that the uh, it's basically a cleanup case. I was on the committee that helped write the self storage ordinance, and uh, if Mr. Potter could probably c concur with this, the self storage ordinance didn't contemplate an interior self storage facility, so it's. Matt Bobich conceived of it because it was some kind of dead space, but very useful if you converted it to self-storage. And then it was, uh, this case came to be because we'd done some of the tenant improvements and we verified with building safety that it was not a change of use between the warehouse and, and self-storage. But zoning, finally got wind of it and said, no, it is a change of use, therefore we're here. And um, that's, that's about it, but uh, yeah, we have no problem with conforming the building to the uh, conditions. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. All right, you have about six minutes left for rebuttal. All right, thank you. Ex excuse me. Um, <clears throat> We do have uh, copies of the rental agreements if you want to see them. All right. Thank you. Should I submit them directly to Francis? Yes. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else here who wishes to testify this evening on case 2013-121? Uh, Would you please come forward at this time? Anyone else at all? All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spring, would you like to come back? Do you have any other comments? You still have time left, or are you finished? Um, I'll pass. All right, thank you very much. What is the wish of the commission? Uh, Commissioner Parks. Madam Chair, I'd like to mo make a motion for approval in case number, um, I've lost it. One two one. Yeah, there it is. Two zero one three dash one two one. The Northern Lights uh, Center uh, site plan review for self storage facility, with uh, the recommendations on the package, and on page nine with the change of July two thousand July first two thousand fourteen for the landscaping and item number six. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ferguson. You've seconded that motion and. Commissioner Parks put in your request for the delayed uh, landscaping installation, so are you all right with that? Perfectly fine, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Is there any objection? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. Thank you very much. Moving on to case 2013-123, the Baton Rouge, oh, Madam findings of fact. I always forget that. <laughs> all right. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this meets the standard for self-storage facilities and vehicle storage, though I understand there's not going to be any vehicle storage on this location. Uh, it also um, 
uh, has the parking circulation required uh, per, uh, per section uh, 21.45.08. And paving drainages have been reviewed and it meets the minimum standards. Uh, there is no fencing and minimum landscaping required on this and I, I think that's uh, appropriate. All right, thank you very much for those findings of fact. Now we're moving on to case 2013-123. The Matanuska Electric Association is the petitioner. The request is a zoning conditional use for a utility substation. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the petition site is Lot 1 Park Subdivision. It's located in Birchwood on the west side of Steffi Street and north of McKinley View Avenue. Uh, the parcel is zoned R6. It contains about 2.07 acres. It was recently subdivided to combine lots 94A and 94B. Um, the utility, there was a utility substation that was constructed over 60 years ago, located on former lot 94B. A single family dwelling was located on former lot 94A. The single family dwelling was removed intact to locate it to a, uh, relocate it to another site. As a result, much of the natural vegetation had to be removed to accommodate that um, building move. Um, this upgrade is occurring in conjunction with the uh, power generation plant that is currently under construction in Eklutna. And uh, the upgrade is essential to meet the uh, growing demands of the um, of the um, community. Now, MEA chose, looked at a number of sites, but in um, looking, determining where to locate this new substation or, or to build a new substation or to upgrade the existing one, they chose to acquire the adjacent parcel, combining it to make the two plus acre site and to expand the parks site as the most efficient and cost effective way to utilize the existing transmission line structures and also the existing easements. Um, access to the site is from Steffi Street, um, which is constructed to municipal standards. However, McKinley View, South, McKinley View Avenue um, abutting the south petition site is not built. Um, in terms of the um, Conformance to the Eagle River Comprehensive Plan, um, the 2006 update stated that one of the goals is to provide public facilities and services that are located, designed, and maintained to accommodate current and future um, needs of the area in an effective, cost-efficient, and timely manner. So looking at the uh, growth of the Eagle River Chugiak area between 1987 and 2005, over 4,000 acres of land has been developed. And based on the load growth uh, projections, MEA identified the need for an upgraded distribution substation in the area adjacent to its existing facilities. Um, the proposed utility substation is found to be consistent with the um, 2006 update to the Eagle River Plan, Chugak Eagle River Plan. Um, there are no specific standards for utility substation in Title 21. The use of a substation is an essential infrastructure element for servicing residential, commercial, and industrial development. Um, the pro proposed upgrade to an existing substation generally meets the standards under AMC 2150-020. The substation has existed for over 60 years and was sized to meet a population of approximately 2,000. By 2010, the population had increased to over 38,000 and is projected to be 52,700 by 2025. The upgrade is necessary to meet both the current and future demands, and the existing site was chosen as being the most efficient and cost-effective and also large enough to accommodate um, the future growth of the area. Um, in reviewing the standards, there did not appear to be any adverse impact on pedestrian or vehicular traffic. Uh, <clears throat> and there should be no adverse impact on air quality. Um, there was one comment that from an adjacent neighbor that was current
concerned about the drainage onto his property because the site has been filled and graded, resulting in a slight elevation of the MEA site. Um, the adjoining neighbor to the northwest was concerned about his septic system field that um, he was, the neighbor was concerned that the um, drainage would adversely affect his leach field. Excuse me. However, drainage plan has been submitted and reviewed by private development. And one of the, con the requirements of the drainage plan is that all drainage must be handled on the MEA site. Also, um, outdoor lighting was of concern as well. And it's going to be a two-level lighting system, one for security lighting and one for maintenance. But maintenance operations will only occur about once a month. So lighting will be outside the fenced area. The lights will be cast down. And um, <coughs> there should not be light leading onto adjacent properties. Now, the land use patterns are fairly well established in the surrounding area. And they are comprised largely of large lot single family residential uses. Another concern was that so much of the natural vegetation has been removed. And one of the um, recommended conditions of approval is for the uh, MEA to um, resolve the um, installation of additional landscaping to buffer along the west and the north property boundary. And because deciduous trees create um, a safety concern, the um, landscaping should be comprised then of coniferous trees that would not create the same safety hazard. The department does recommend approval of the um, utility substation site plan subject to conditions on pages 11 through 12 of the packet. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, page 12 of the packet, um, recommendation number uh, five reads, amend the sheet one of two of landscape plan to show the existing vegetation to be retained on site. Um, if the vegetation's already been removed, what constitutes the existing vegetation? The Chair, Mr. Ferguson, the application stated that some of the existing vegetation was preserved along the west property boundary. But there was quite a bit of vegetation because it was a very small utility substation that was originally built 60 years ago. But much of the natural vegetation has been removed. They did on the um, site plan indicate that there were some trees. But we would like a, um, a landscape plan to show how many trees are there, what kind of trees are there, so that we know how to supplement the trees along the west boundary and the north property boundary. Okay, thank you. Next question. You mentioned that the drainage plan required that the drainage be handled on site. I don't see that as one of the recommendations in this document. Um, through the chair, Mr. Ferguson, um, the drainage plan was reviewed after the document was written. And so I talked with the um, the person that reviews drainage plans, and that will be a re that is a requirement of the land use permit. Would it be appropriate to include a recommendation seven that the the drainage shall be handled um, handled on the property? Um, Madam Chair, Mr. Ferguson, yes, because it would um, it would reinforce what is going to be required of the land use permit. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, is there the petitioner's representative here this evening? So would you please come forward?
Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, staff, and public. Thank you for the opportunity to take this up and see if we can get this moved on tonight. Um, I don't have a lot to add to what uh, the staff has, and I think your packet's uh, fairly thorough. I uh, will make a couple of comments that the uh, um, MEA is a co-op, and we have a new power plant, which you're all aware of, uh, being constructed at this time at Teklutna. And we have uh, pursued in every way uh, in the uh, ordinances and the uh, rezoning and the acquisition of the property from McClutney to include the public and to take into consideration their concerns. Uh, at this particular location, uh, the Eagle River area feed comes primarily from Anchorage and was kind of on the small end at Eklutna. So now we're reversing that. So this is an essential piece of our overall plan is to upgrade the uh, uh, old park substation and, and allow for that power to come back from a generation site to the Eagle River area. Uh, as a result, uh, my first piece or my first fingerprint on the project was to visit the neighborhood and I talked with I think uh, 26 uh, people in the neighborhood there. Um, Having grown up there at Peters Creek, it was kind of pleasurable because there was a lot of old timers around there. And, and uh, we found that there was little objection to the expansion with an understanding that they saw the need for what we we're trying to do there, the co-op to improve the uh, service and reliability of the power in our area. And we have had the neighbor uh, to the west there, uh, Mr. McNamara, and he's here tonight uh, to speak to you. And we have had uh, multiple discussions about that impact. Uh, what I would say about the drainage particularly is that we've assured uh, Mr. McNamara that we will, if necessary, provide a letter from our engineer that says that there will be no impact, uh, negative impact on his uh, lift station, his uh, mound system septic there. And uh, so we've got our engineers at this time working on a design to uh, hold the water. Uh, there's pretty strict requirements now at MOA on um, water migrating from the site, basically you can't let a rain, raindrop leave the, leave the site. And so we're in the process of that. And as uh, the staff member, uh, Margaret, uh, indicated that is part of our land use permit, and we're prepared to um, provide that information to them uh, for the issuance of that permit. And it'll be an extensive uh, engineer calculated uh, design. It'll put a, probably an L-shaped uh, leach field or French drain underneath the property there on that corner that would be suitable for holding uh, the 100 year rain event. Uh, we've talked about the fencing and lighting and, and the uh, landscaping and I think we've pretty much covered uh, what uh, is essential and what necessary for us to, to make that work. Uh, I'll reserve the rest of my time. Uh, if necessary, you would want to ask questions. Uh, free to answer. All right, thank you. May we have your name for the record, please? My name is Yukon Tanner, uh, project manager for Madness Electric. All right, thank you very much. We do have, you have about four minutes left for rebuttal. We do have some questions in in the queue. Commissioner Ferguson and then uh, Commissioner Pruse. One quick question. You talked about the first lighting level being security lighting level, the second lighting level being maintenance level. And the second lighting level you identify as two foot candles. Do you have any? Uh, do you have any idea what the level of lighting you would have for the first security level? I do not. I think that the specifications that we provided with the uh, packet there should uh, demonstrate what that is. But the, we did specifically uh, look at it as a two-level lighting system. I, I appreciate that, but it wasn't. It. Thank you. No further questions. Commissioner Pruz. Uh, just out of curiosity, this uh, upgrade that you plan on doing the substation, is it going to be self-funded internally through a cooperative or a, a state or AEA money? What, what, where are the dollars coming from? I can't uh, address the issue of the financing for it. Uh, Jim, uh, who is with me, and Jim Brooks is one of our project managers. Uh, he might be able to address the financing question. Jim, is that... Thank you, Commissioner Pruse, through the chairman. My name is Jim Brooks, and I am the project engineer for this project. Uh, 
And to answer your question, the, it would be MEA funded. There's no AEA participation, no state funding. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? All right. Seeing and hearing none, are, is there someone in the public here who wishes to testify? You have about four and a half minutes left for your rebuttal. Thank you. All right. Anyone here who wishes to testify, please come forward at this time. Clearly state your name for the record, please. And if you are an individual, you have three minutes. Okay. Yes. Uh, good, good evening. My name is Kevin McNamara, and I live directly behind this proposed uh, project. And uh, um, since I only have three minutes, I'll make this short and sweet. I, I, made, I made a bunch of pictures and made some reference to some of the items in the 102-page document that was out there, but I'll, I'll try to, to cut to the chase. Um, Mr. Tanner interviewed, as appropriately, all of the individuals or all of the property owners around the, the uh, surrounding area uh, in the fall of last year, and at the time, had little or no information as far as the size of the project, um, the extent of the project. The conversation at that point in time was there will be a public meeting that will uh, assist in, in, in laying out some guidelines as far as the property, the size, uh, the general footprint of this project. Um, it was my understanding there was to be a, um, a public meeting prior to the start of any, um, uh, any construction. Um, before too long, the land was cleared. Uh, they started hauling in gravel. And at this point, the site is six feet plus higher than my ground level at my backyard. So there is a significant uh, increase in the ground level uh, adjacent to my, to my property. Um, thus, the original concern for the, uh, for the drainage issue. More importantly, um, I had uh, inquired of Mr. Tanner the footprint of this project early on. Uh, I met with him, looked at the general uh, blueprints. It was just a ground level blueprint. Asked him for um, height altitude measurements of some of the projects because two of the items that were of concern were two tower, A-frame towers that are uh, on the west side of their property, 25 feet from my property line. And at the time, he didn't have any dimensional information. Uh, a week ago, Monday, um, he called me up, as he had promised, and we learned then that these towers were 40 feet tall. And so in conjunction with the six feet plus of, of uh, ground level increase, plus the additional three or four feet that the sonotubes for these towers are going to fit on, the top of those towers are now some 50 feet off of my property line as far as, as altitude levels. More importantly than that, there are six, a total of six high voltage power lines coming to those two towers, one in and one out. So three, three coming in from the, from the eastbound power line, they'll be processed through this substation and then, um, through the other tower processed back out to go westbound. My concern is, is a couple of different issues. Now that we learned the overall expanse of this project, how big it is, I've got certainly with these high tension power lines so close to my property, um, I'm very much concerned about the um, health and safety hazard, depending on which way you look. You can go in one direction and breathing normal air will kill you. You can go to the other direction and nothing will happen. It's kind of the same thing with the, with, with the, the power source. My concern at this point is, again, it's a personal issue. My wife is a three-year breast cancer survivor. These power lines scare the hell out of her. So we have an issue there. The second issue is the effect of this large project on my property value and the future resaleability of this property. When I moved in, there was an existing power station or substation on the adjoining property, and it's, it's lot 94A, um, low profile, power lines go out of the east end of it, uh, again, very low profile, shrouded by a fairly substantial green belt between my property and the old a substation. Now that lot to the east is completely barren. Granite, we've talked about um, landscaping issues and things. 
and we've had several conversations over that. My concern is with these towers being 50 feet tall, you're not going to plant 50 feet tall trees. So again, that's, I mean, that's the long and the short of my issue at this point. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, Commissioner Mulcahy, do you have a question? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about the, the drainage, and it sounds like that uh, that there's a between the administration or the staff and, and uh, the petitioner that they've got a plan. If, and if they said you've been, they talked to you about it. Is it the drainage plan? Is that seem to be being resolved? My understanding that the engineers have are in the process of developing a, um, a a drainage plan to be approved by the commission. It's it's my understanding at this point that plan has still not been completed. Um, the we talked a little bit about the the, the proposal. And I suppose it makes sense. The challenge that I have is the, the, we, we've got a, a French drain type affair that water's going to go down. All of that, given the grade height of that property, all of that water is going to funnel down to the northwest corner of their property, which happens to be the northeast corner of my property where my septic uh, field is, drains into, and we already have a diminished uh, water table level. Um, it'll be up to the engineers to decide and do their water samples. I know they've been out there doing some uh, test holes, some uh, perk holes, so I haven't seen the results of that yet. I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like they're heading in the right direction if they can, if they can adequately direct those French drains away from your property. It seems like it's, it's doable. It sounds like it's doable. According to the general information that I have, that, that all that property is, is uh, uh, crisscrossed diagonally by underground fissures of bedrock, and, and it may be that the bulk of the water, there is an underground stream um, that they're currently fighting with uh, every hole they drill that fills up with water, and apparently it's it's on the. It's towards the uh, the, the northeast of the property. So, um, depending on what the engineers find, if if that indeed is where it drains and it stays on that on that northeast side uh, of that of that drain field, then it it probably won't affect. But there again, I don't I don't have. So, if we had a condition here along those lines where they will address the drainage to ensure that it doesn't impact your property. That's right. We that, we need that to. Sounds, uh, Sounds like it's on the right direction, I, and I understand the drainage issues out in our area, Birchwood, Peters Creek. It's <laughs> right. <laughs> who knows what's going on underground? They're, they're, they've got some studying to do to figure that out. Uh, how about the buffer? Does that seem to be heading in the right direction? Are they are they addressing your concerns and providing adequate buffer? We've I mean, talked it, about several different proposals for the buffer. Um, uh, and everything from from putting in a mound with trees on top of it to to some type of a of a in order to minimize the the footprint a, 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 a concrete terrace type affair. Again, the challenge is is with 50 foot towers and power lines on top of them, you're still going to have the issue of you know looking over the top of them. Um, so not quite sold on. On, on that part of the process, um, but again, I think more importantly for for me is uh, is the aesthetics of it is is going to be a real issue as far as future say, resale. I have uh, solicited some information or comments from uh, Northland Realty in uh, in Eagle River. Um, their comment, and they they said that they would actually put it in writing, and and uh, and I spoke specifically with Nancy Stolle, and she gave me permission to use her name and their company's business name. Um, in the effect of the enormity of the project, that in and of itself would certainly have an effect on the potential customers for that. Um, their comment also was is that it would have a negative effect on the property value. Um, you know, I've lived in that, I bought that house in 1989, so I've been there a long time. Um, I'm, over the last 10 years, we've put a tremendous amount of money into the house so that when we get ready to retire, I won't have to do anything to it but turn the key and live in it and pay taxes. And so, you know, now that whole aspect is being compromised. Um, it's out of our control. I mean, it's something that had we had the information 
when we were first interviewed, had we had the, the public meeting prior to the, the start of this project, we might have had the opportunity then to, uh, okay, can we look at alternate sites? Can we re redesign this project to have a lower profile on the west end of their project. We never had that opportunity. The only opportunity we have now is tonight, the, the, the foundation work is near about done on it. Um, they're to the point now to where they're pouring concrete. Um, so, we're, you know, as far as the, the, the conditional land use permit was superseded by the, by the foundation permit. So we kind of put the cart in front of the horse before we had a full idea of, of what kind of a package we had. Commissioner Pruse, do you have a question, comment? Uh, what is the distance from the first the large well, the towers and your residence? I'm sorry. What is the distance between the towers and your residence or your? The um, there's a the perimeter fence that's on the west side uh, is 25 feet. Those towers are approximately five to seven feet from the from the perimeter fence um, as far as the footprint goes. And then that makes those towers somewhere within 80 to 100 feet of my, the back of my house at, at a 50-foot level. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson? I have a question for staff. This is apparently an R6 lot. Is there a height limitation on an R6 lot? Madam Chair, Mr. Ferguson, it's unrestricted. It's unrestricted. What is the, I'm assuming this would be a side setback. What is the side setback for the R6 lot? Um, through the chair, Mr. Ferguson, this is a corner lot, so they have a um, primary front yard, which is long, which is 50 feet wide along the south property boundary. They have a secondary front yard along mm -hmm. Steffi Street, which is 25 feet. And then they have 25-foot side yard setbacks along the north and west property boundary. The um, fence is set back 50 and 25 feet from their property boundaries because it's an 8-foot high fence. And um, there is setting it back out of the required setbacks. They can have an 8-foot high fence without the need for variance from the Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals. Thank you. All right. Um, there are no other questions for uh, Commissioner Robinson. I beg yes. your pardon. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question for staff. Um, uh, you the, may sit down. Thank the, you. Thank you. The, the, um, the comments and, and I think the testimony of the petitioner talk about sort of substantial work. The pictures, in fact, show substantial work both in terms of clearing and leveling of the site. Can you explain, you know, how this, this was permitted in advance of the conditional use permit? Um, through the chair, Mr. Robinson, the pictures that were supplied with the application were of a different site than the petition site. Um, the project, ma um, project management and engineering uh, went ahead and issued a permit for foundation at the owner's risk. So the building, the land use permit was issued at the owner's risk. Is that common practice when there's a conditional use permit involved? I understand that you can certainly apply for one in advance of building permits, but does is that also common practice when when it's a conditional use permit? Um, it, Madam Chair, Mr. Robinson, when. Um, Applicants are up against a timeline, whether it be financial or weather-wise. Um, and if they have asked for a building permit, they have submitted it and it's in review. And they have asked for a building permit. It has occurred upon occasion that uh, building safety will say, okay, if the, if the um, pressure on the applicant is that great, whether it be financial or whether it's something they have to get done, we will issue you the permit, but be aware this is at your own risk. And if whatever is contingent on being, um, for the permit to be issued, if it's not approved, then, um, 
the loss is yours if it has to be removed. If whatever um, improvements you've made have to be removed. I, I understand that. I think, I think in this case, perhaps the problem is when you're doing a conditional use for a, a, a use that is not typical of the R6 district, is accessory to that district, is necessary. We understand that. But when you understand that the conditions often imposed in a conditional use are, in fact, to leave the existing conditions alone, I find it problematic that, that you can go ahead and clear ahead of that. And put in a foundation, is that my understanding as well? Um, for whatever was issued, I'd have to defer to the petitioner. But you don't need a permit to clear your property. And they were, they had to, they removed the building for which they would need a building permit to uh, relocate the building. But I don't know if they would need a land use permit, but they were not adding to the property. And you don't need a permit to uh, remove vegetation from your property. But what about the foundation? I have to defer to the petitioner if the foundation was poured. Or uh, if anything was poured. All right. So um, we have several other uh, petitioners, uh, our, our questions in the queue. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, and then I have a question of staff okay. as well. You bring in more than 500 yards of gravel, don't you need a, fi a fill permit? Um, Mr. Ferguson, I don't know. I believe you do. All right. Thank you very much. So, um, Ms. McConnell, um, before we close the public hearing, my question is, um, if the Planning and Zoning Commission chose not to um, approve the zoning conditional use for a utility substation, what happens? Madam Chair, mm -hmm. the uh, petitioner could accept the denial and walk away and try to find another site for their needs, or they could appeal the decision to the Board of Adjustment. To the Board of Adjustment? Yes. And how, what is the length of time for that appeal? They have 20 days from the approval of the resolution. So whatever decision you make, approval or denial, will generate a resolution. Once you approve the resolution, they have 20 days to file an appeal. All right. And how long does it take the Board of Adjustment to um, respond to an appeal, generally speaking? Madam Chair, there are some timelines, but I will have to look them up in code. I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. All right. Thank you. Well, we will continue the public hearing, and perhaps you could get back to us. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to testify? Anyone else at all? Ah, Commissioner Ferguson. All right, so it's the petitioner's uh, representative. He has, uh, if you would please come forward. Um, you have about five minutes, I think, uh, for your rebuttal. Um, so let's have you give your rebuttal, and then Commissioner Ferguson, you can ans ask your questions. All right. If I may um, give you a thumbnail sketch of our history of how we brought about this process for ourselves. When I first went to MOA over a year ago, there was multiple counters, of course, that you have to deal with. And so I went to the counter where I thought that we would start with a land use permit. And I was told that because we could petition for conditional use because of the existing use, that I was sent over to the uh, community development counter. And when I got over there, I was told that we first had to do the replat because MEA ironically owned that two and a half acres 50 years ago, and they subdivided and sold it. So we had to go through a 10-month process to take the lot line out to establish one lot. And I, was, I asked the staff at the counter, could I run both of those requests, the replat and the conditional use permit together? And I was told no, that it's too confusing here and there. And so we separated those and we did the replat, which I said took 10 months. And then we pursued the conditional use permit. Well, the 10 months put us into this time of year for pouring our concrete 
and so I was then told that I could ask for a land use permit prior to the issuance of the conditional use permit, which we did, and so we got the land use permit for footings and foundations to go ahead and do our uh, excavation of our foundations so we could pour our cement. So from our perspective, we attempted to visit every counter and do our due diligence to provide everything necessary uh, for your sake and for ours. Uh, do you have any other comments for your rebuttal? Uh, only that uh, the drainage plan that we're looking at, uh, I talked with the engineer this afternoon, and we are looking at an upslope uh, receiving ditch that we had looked originally at just a downslope, but we think that the water that's immigrating, uh, migrating in from up above, could be absorbed there, and then any water that was contained on the site we could contain in that lower area. So we are looking at that as we speak, and we're optimistic that we can resolve that. All right. Well, there are several commissioners who have questions, so if you'll <clears throat> stay at the podium, we'd appreciate it. Commissioner Parks. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I guess I've got a, a couple of questions for you. Would you have any problem putting in the, in the conditions of that uh, you would have engineer drainage uh, completed and approved prior to uh, uh, as a part of condition an engineered drainage plan engineered training drainage plan for this property do you have any issues with that being a condition yeah I guess my answer to that question would be um, we know that in order to get the land use permit which was a separate permit from this conditional use permit that that drainage plan has to be approved by the MOA so that that's a that's a given. Uh, I would uh, I guess be reluctant to to agree that we should hold this permit up until that permit's approved, only because we're up against the weather and, and we're trying to get the thing out of the ground uh, prior to frost. But I it would be only a condition of this use. You would have to have that in place. That's how it works. I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty hearing you. I said it it is. It would be a condition of this that you would have to have that in place, which was, is the engineered uh, uh, drainage plan. Uh, prior to a final approval of this permit or subject to? Well, well it would be subject to. I mean, you'd have to yeah, have that, that done. That's fine. That, that's, that's fine. That's acceptable. And also the buffer is a concern that I have. It's, I, I, it's hard for me to visualize what it looks like from his backyard. I don't know if you clear cut the trees all the way up to the line. But, however, that, that buffer zone ought to be reseated and, and, and giving what he had before if it has been cut. Is that an issue? Let me describe on that west boundary that's a that's a downslope boundary and there there is some vegetation on the upper side of that behind the old substation which I think you can see in those photographs. And then we talked with Mr. McNamara out on the property line before we commenced clearing, and we did leave uh, six, eight large uh, spruce trees along that property line, and then we put some, uh, and that's still vegetated uh, inside that 25-foot buffer area. There's still some vegetation that we left there, um, and the he asked for some access restrictions, and so we placed some large boulders along that access so wheelers can't come back through on his backyard fence line. And so we've, we've tried to mitigate in every way we can, and we hope to be able to leave that natural vegetation, including those large spruce trees, in place. The only thing that would impact that, as I indicated to him, is if that drainage field required an L shape to go up that slope some distance, some of those trees might have to be removed. But we're trying to design it so that it's on that lower side and all that natural vegetation can remain. If you could do this and look in the package on picture number six or photograph number six, okay. page uh, six in the uh, application for conditional use. My assumption is, is the house that I see in the background is the one we're addressing. Is that correct? That's, cor that's correct. That's correct. Do you have a picture that shows from his view in on what that looks like? I mean, it's a very nice picture in the front. Can you show me a picture from the other side that would be looking back towards us? We do not. I, I did not take any photos from his deck uh, looking this way. I can describe that to you. I do have a, uh, a current photo on my camera in my truck that I took today standing with my back to his fence but not on his property looking out toward the... Uh, describe that to me. Is there just 
several large spruce trees? Is that what it is? That's correct. All the underbrush has been cut? That's correct. All right, thank you very much. Um, n let me ask staff. Staff, do you have a photo showing what uh, Commissioner Parks requested? Any Adam, extra there, photos? We were discussing the appeal uh, issues. Could you, could Mr. Parks remind us what photo he's looking for? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the one that shows looking from the McNair Moneris property on to the site. We've got one that looks across it, and I can see their house, but I can't see it the other direction. See what the view is from the standpoint of what's been cut. And, and you've got the same photographs in the package. So I was looking at the colored package, uh, the colored photographs in the petitioner's package. So do, do you have a photograph of that, Mr. McNair? Could you bring that and show that to us, please? I'd be interested to see that. All right. Thank you very much. Commissioner Robinson. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Just for clarification, um, I, I couldn't – did you say that you asked for and were granted a, la a land use permit as part of your – being granted a foundation permit or you or you have not and then I heard you say after the fact that you still ha have to go back for a land use permit so could you clarify we were, we were given a at-risk uh, land use permit uh, to do the footings and foundations continued upon finalizing our uh, we have to put in a 96 foot cul-de-sac on a, the traffic plan and we have to put in the drainage uh, system as part of that and, and again, I, I'd reiterate, you, you, you were told by staff that you could not pursue a conditional use permit and a plat concurrently? Uh, ask the question again. I, I think I heard you say that you were, when you asked, you were told that you could not pursue the conditional use and the plat concurrently at the same time. Is that, is that true? That is correct. Madam Chair, could I ask, could I yes, direct that please. to staff? Yes, is, please. Is that? Please. I just went, sir, sir, I'm sorry. Um, you, you, you must go back. If I Commissioner may, uh, Robinson. To staff. Uh, if I could, I, 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 the, testi the testimony is that, that um, the petitioner asked in the interest of time. It seems like we're here for a couple of reasons, but one is which the process has taken a long time and we're nearing the end of the season and so we're rushing to get things done. And in my opinion, we've sort of let things proceed maybe faster than they should have. But can, can, a, can someone not pursue a conditional use permit and a plat concurrently? Um. Through the chair, Mr. Robinson, they can. So evident, evidently either the petitioner heard something different or, or got some bad information. Um, the planning department, uh, the planning section would not have, I don't believe would have said that to an applicant because we've done that in the past. That's what I thought. So I don't know. Uh, how the information was relayed to the applicant that they could not do it um, concurrently. If I, if I may, Madam Chair, respond to that. Um, when I went over to that counter and talked with Dave Whitfield, uh, who is in charge or responsible, I guess, for the replatting section, I asked Dave specifically, can I run these together? I was talking to him about timelines for acquiring the permits necessary. And that's when he said, we just had one go through like that. It was very confusing. The answer was no. When I went back to sign the final plat, he came out because he records the plat. And he said to me, why didn't you run these two together? And I said, Dave, standing right there where you're standing right now, 10 months ago, you told me it was too confusing and you chose not to run them together, but they should be ran separately. Um, we're going to leave that for now and we'll come back uh, to that question. Uh, Commissioner Pruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple questions. Um, so I'm trying to. Uh, just a real quick question. I assume you did an SWPP Could plan for the for the work. For the mic, I'm having a hard time hearing. Did you do a stormwater prevention plan? Yes, we do. 
And what did it show where the drainage was going to go? The drainage is going to that uh, northwest corner now. And in fact, we've been pumping some groundwater on the surface to that per our SWIP plan, and it's dissipating into the ground on that corner. There's no standing water there. Okay. We, we, got, we had testimony tonight that said that they really weren't informed of what the magnitude of the development expansion of the of the substation was <clears throat> however you did do a foundation installation so obviously there was a, a plan of what you were going to build could you tell me when the last time you talked to the neighbor versus when the plan design was was implemented before you started the foundation and did you talk to the to the neighbor that testified here tonight after after you had your foundation plan, after you had the plan to build your foundation? As a project manager doing multiple MEA projects, I receive uh, from Jim um, the plans and the specifications prior to uh, the work beginning on the site. So my piece is, is taking it once those are placed in my hands. And he may be able to address the question of the availability of those prints. Uh, I did not have those when I canvassed the neighborhood uh, earlier in the year. And in fact, I was told again at that same counter where Dave Whitfield was that I had to, it was a requirement to go to those neighbors. And then when I took that package back in later, they said, oh, why did you do that? You didn't have to do that. There'll be a public hearing later. So it's somewhat confusing dealing with the organization over there, but we, we did our due diligence and we felt like we pursued it in every way possible. So if you would like to ask a question of Jim as to specifically why those prints were available, when they were made available to me, uh, I talked with uh, Mr. McNamara, uh, as he said, multiple conversations in his home and invited him over to the site into the uh, job shack there to look at the prints and, and go over those as they were available to me. Had you already started clearing before that time? Yes, we did. Uh, I talked with the MOA again about the clearing, uh, and they, was, they have a rule if it's two acres or less or some, some something in that neighborhood. And in order to move the house off the property, uh, we had to take out the vegetation around that perimeter to get the, uh, the assets. There was a, a separated garage and the house and uh, another building that had to be removed from the property. All right, thank you. Commissioner Ferguson. Having trouble understanding where the lines access the plant and where they exit the plant in relation to the house in question. Um, Mr. McNamara's property, as you, if you look at the map and you come up Steffi Street, it's a dead end. There's a cul-de-sac on that dead end street, so he is the back of his house would be to the right of that uh, street. So our access for the gates and the construction is off of Steffi Street directly onto the property, as depicted in the photographs. I am interested in uh, where the power lines come into. Uh, the power lines, if, if you look at, let me see. Looking at the plan just ahead of photo six. Just ahead. So, so Mr. McNamara, uh, lot 93. If you look at photo three, uh, photograph number three in the packet, that's the end of the dead end street, the cul-de-sac, and you can see the top right, there's a transmission line there, and then straight ahead in your view, you vaguely see or barely see some transmission line wires uh, going along through kind of the, through the middle of the trees there. And just to the left of that, there's an intersection of a transmission line, and there are some large towers there as well, just behind the church. Who sets the standards for power line design? Commissioner Ferguson, through the chair. Uh, there are a number of organizations that we have to uh, adhere to standard codes. Among those are the project owners for the AEA transmission line, and then there's NFPA codes that dictate and uh, uniform uh, electrical safety. Are, are your poles, in fact, how tall are your poles? I, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. I just, I don't recall the exact number of uh, feet for those. I mean, we heard testimony that 
there must be like 50 foot poles would that be close well there the that is probably close for the size of the you have to understand that the structures that um, mr. McNamara was referring to are bus support structures they're not actually the poles and um, how tall are your bus support structures uh, they're in the neighborhood of 40 feet and the the driving factor that caused us to move to this new substation is to get away from 100 foot bus support because the we could have built this on the existing footprint but we'd have had structures to the moon because the footprint of the site was so narrow so we worked hard to get them down to as low as we could but and you know we have to maintain electrical clearances so that's where we're at okay so 40 foot is in your opinion the minimum the minimum that would apply with the code you have to work yes with. thank you no further questions Commissioner Parts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I got an opportunity to look at the pictures, and I guess that any time I built anything in this town, uh, I'd have a civil engineering drawing on where the runoff was going to go and, and how it was going to affect the neighbors, uh, whether you do a parking lot or you do a footing and foundation. And looking at these pictures, it looks like you built a pad that's somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five feet high in, in, on a property line. And did you have civil drawings? that were approved by the municipality to do that prior to that construction being done? Yes, this basically the same submittal packet was submitted to the uh, counter there that does the land use pl planning and the civil drawings were included in that. Off of the Steffi Street, that's basically on grade access onto the property. Uh, on the back of the line where Mr. McNamara's property adjoins us, there it tapers down, and so he does have maybe a six-foot fill on that lower corner. But off of Steffi Street, it is in that grade to access. Well, I'm looking at something that looks like a civil drawing um, in your packet, and it says issue for reference only, and I, it doesn't have a page number on it, but it's that package, that page right there. There is no one in the world I can figure out what the, the grid lines are on that. But it looks like you, you, you've got a very steep piece of property uh, to the south. And um, I don't know where the McNamara's property is, but on the pictures that we just saw, I would be concerned about that if I were building a building. If you look at photo number three, which uh, is the end of the cul-de-sac uh, looking, so you're coming off a of North Birchwood Loop and driving up slope to the end of that cul-de-sac and you'll see that rise in the terrain so that site plan that you're looking at which shows the uh, the I believe that you're looking at the drainage plan you'll see that those uh, uh, lines for the drainage uh, separation or the um, uh, demographic lines are not demographic but the uh, um, topographic lines are, are in that 50 foot setback area going upslope to the property line on the back side of the old substation. Yeah, I'm looking at this photograph. Is the house that I see in the middle of that picture, is that the McNamara house? I can see a, a, a picture right almost in the middle, right above the little rise on, on photograph number three. No, there are no pictures uh, in the packet of the, uh, the old structure that was there. Those uh, pictures on photo one and two are typical of what a substation control house looks like that uh, that are used today in new substations that that's from a different substation but we put the photo in there to give a visual of what the the color and and what the, uh, the structure looks like itself thank you <clears throat> commissioner Pruce did you have a question comments? I, do, I do um so uh is there a uh, option to bury the power lines going into the property is there an option for going somewhere else with this power lines? Instead of bringing it in over, overhead, is that at the property line to, to bury it and bring it in? I'll let uh, Jim answer that question. Commissioner Proves through the uh, chairwoman. Um, I guess the short answer is that is not an option uh, for a number of reasons. Um, largely because we're dealing with two different levels of transmission well we're dealing with transmission lines and distribution lines I think the lines that you're perhaps referring to are the transmission lines 
the uh, distribution lines do exit the substation underground towards Steffi Street. Uh, and uh, for that reason alone, there would be so many conflicts that we would never be able to find a spot to put the transmission lines. Um, I'd also like to clarify something that was stated earlier. We are not, by nature of this improvement, changing the number of lines that leave and enter the substation from a capacity standpoint. Um, the, the station as it currently exists is what we call a tap. So just to lay out things so you have a clear picture, we have a double circuit transmission line from MLNP plant two on the edge, uh, on the edge of, M of Anchorage and it goes to the Eklutna Hydro plant up on the old Glen Highway. It's double circuit. Um, as it's currently configured, only one of the two circuits is energized. And then at our park substation, there is simply a T that goes into the substation. What's happening is part, and really the important aspect of this upgrade is that that single line into the park substation will now go into the substation and come back out. In addition to that, we are going to energize the second circuit. And that second circuit will be the bulk current carrying um, circuit for power coming from MLNP's plant to the Eklutna project. So the net effect of that will be to lower the current um, on the, what we will term the line that moves bulk generation as the express line. That, then that would be the line that Park Substation is currently on. We will be now feeding it from what we call the local circuit which only serves customer load, has a much lower um, current rating, and consequently the health concerns associated with it to the extent those are a concern go down. It's directly related to how much current you're carrying through the line, the, the effect of the electric field. Additionally, we're moving all of those to the front closer to Steffi Street, so the net effect for the McNamara's is that their exposure is going to be less because we're moving all of the field generating equipment, uh, the bulk of it, closer to the street. We're not, we are increasing the capability of the substation to supply load. We are not increasing the load. We're actually diminishing it. So, so again, my question was, so your answer is, is that on this additional piece of property that you're doing this work on, there is no room on any of it to bury the transition line? There are too many conflicts with both our utilities and a buried, uh, some other buried facilities, gas and uh, telephone. And they were there prior to you? Yes, that is correct. Property. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I don't see anyone uh, in the queue, um, but um, Erica, uh, so thank you very much for your testimony. And I think is the, uh, is there anyone else? We're, we're finished, so with the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. McConnell, you've beaten me to the punch here because here you are in the queue. And as the current planning section chief, can you tell me about the procedure of the platting, of the platting application and the conditional use process simultaneously or not? Thank you, Madam Chair. As Ms. O'Brien stated, um, that is something, th those are two processes that have happened concurrently in the past. Uh, Mr. Tanner has stated that that was the information he received. None of the people here tonight were at the counter at that time. It would be my guess that perhaps there was a misunderstanding, um, but I, I can only tell you that I will go back and ask Mr. Whitfield if he recalls the situation uh, because, again, those are two processes that um, can happen and, and have happened concurrently in the past. And before I finish, I, just, I rang in to um, give you some information that you requested regarding the appeal process. All right. Uh, the pro there, are, there are several steps that take place once um, an appeal is filed. Um, in terms of briefs and reply briefs and that sort of thing that can take 
um, several months, two, two to three months, but ultimately the Board of Adjustment has no fixed requirement to hold their um, hearing at any particular time after the appeal is filed. So uh, depending on their availability, the support that they get from the clerk's office, um, you know, the, the process could, there's really nothing to make sure that the process happens expeditiously. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other questions of staff at this time? We're going to take a short break. We've been sitting now for some of us for almost three hours, so we're going to take a little break. But before that, is there any other additional information that the commissioners would like to have? All right, thanks. We'll reconvene in about five or seven minutes. Thank you. All right, there you go. All right. May I have a motion, please? Commissioner Parks. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, case number 2013-123. Uh, Matanuska Electric uh, uh, on a conditional use on an upgrade of utility subdivision. All right. May I have a second? Do I have a second? Commissioner Mulcahy. And Madam Chair, I'd like to speak to my motion. All right. Uh, I will not be supporting this motion. I believe that we've got several issues at hand here. Some are overreaching um, uh, in a land use um, uh, by bringing in backfill um, prior to having a full permit and a conditional use. Um, I think there's other issues uh, that are beyond that that need to be addressed, so I will not be supporting this. All right. Uh, Commissioner Mulcahy, you're in the queue. I likewise will not be supporting the motion. Um, I understand the need for this. I understand how critically important it is to the whole overall um, MEA's new power project. And so hopefully some kind of solution can be developed here in the near future and move, move out expeditiously. But uh, as um, Commissioner Parks just said, there are several problems with this. Uh, and I don't see um, the petitioner offering a way forward uh, to reconcile uh, primarily the, the impact on the neighbor's lot, the lack of a, a, a buffer potential drainage issues. That area is notorious for problematic drainage. Um, that type of work should have been done before this was brought to us. All right. Thank you very much. We have uh, Commissioner Robinson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, um, could I ask a clarifying question of staff, please? Certainly. Um, if if uh, the conditional use is, is uh, denied, uh, is the only recourse to either appeal or to refile a conditional use? Can, can you clarify, as opposed to if it were postponed, obviously, to a different time, there could be some uh, benefits in, in the timeline. Is that, is that correct? Um, Madam Ch Chair, Mr. Robinson, it could be returned for redesign if the problems as you feel exist can be addressed and they could come back um, showing that they have addressed the problems that the condition that the commission has enunciated what i have here is there's several problems that impact on the neighbor's lot there's drainage and um, there are some um, one comment was there are other problems that ha haven't been elaborated upon if the commission wants to return this for redesign uh, to give the applicant um, direction on what they would like to see to um, try to solve some of the problems that they see in this particular application that might um, give the applicant some um, um, guidance. For instance, having a landscape plan, I know that um, in discussions with um, one of the petition representatives tonight, they had discussed having, trying to build up the west property boundary through a s series of um, uh, um, terraces and then having a berm on top of the terraces and then um, planting the trees on top of the berm so that that would raise the um, buffer considerably, maybe not to the height of 40 feet, but would raise the buffer considerably adjacent to uh, the one landowner that has testified tonight. Um, so 
rather than um, that's another option that the commission could consider. Thank you. If I may, Thank Madam you. Chair, speak, speak to the main motion. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not inclined to uh, support the motion. At the same time, I would support a, a return for redesign. I, I want to just speak to my, my thinking there. Um, number one, I believe that um, it's, a, it's a very unfortunate situation, and I believe the petitioner received some information from the municipality in some direction that maybe was premature and not the best consultation. In particular, when you're dealing with a conditional use permit, uh, I think there's a re one of the most common conditions placed upon uh, these types of uses is a maintenance of existing buffer or existing vegetation that compared to planting trees that will take years to grow, keeping what's already there certainly is something that is effective uh, and probably shields the property owner to the best degree possible. As he has stated, he knew he was purchasing land next to a utility substation at the same time I don't think anyone could have expected the, the clearing um, to, to take place to this degree. So uh, if, if others are uh, open to a, a motion to return to redesign or postponement, I would entertain that. Otherwise, if there's no additional motion, um, I also will not be supporting the main motion. All right. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, you're in the queue. Thank you very much. Um, I, I cannot what we have before us but I don't believe the, the wise thing to do is just vote it down I think it'd be better to ask to have it returned for more design to get something that, that addresses the concerns that have been raised and at the same time we need the electricity and I mean I'm looking for a solution that works for both parties and I recognize we can't find a perfect solution but I believe a harder effort to try to, to recognize the concerns of, of the neighbor with this would be appropriate. And so I would support a, a motion for uh, return, the, return this to the applicant to come back with a redesign. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pruse? Yeah, I, I will not be supporting this motion also. I, be, I believe that uh, if it does not pass, it obviously can be resubmitted in, uh, to the commission at a later date with, with some more due diligence by the petitioner uh, in consultation with the, with the neighbor in, and with, in, with the proper uh, sequence of uh, events with, with planning. I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I think the uh, a no vote is pretty obvious that uh, it's not dead in the water, that all it does is it, it causes a reset uh, for the petitioner to do some more due diligence and homework and bring back something with a plan that addresses uh, obvious concerns that uh, some of the members of this commission have. Thank you. Um, I, I, point of clarification, uh, Ms. McConnell, uh, at what point in time can, if the, if, the, if the conditional use is denied, at what point in time can they return? Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I do not believe there is a prohibition on reapplying as there is with some other types of cases on, on a conditional use. Uh, there is not that prohibition. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I am not going to be supporting the motion. I think um, that public entities or cooperatives need to follow the same rules and regulations that private developers do. And I feel for whatever reason that has not occurred. Um, I did not hear any mention of attendance at community council. This is a, a major construction uh, project and uh, obviously in an R6 zone that has, that in, has impact. Uh, so I will not be supporting the motion. Uh, Commissioner Mulcahy. I guess I need a little clarification of procedures here. So it sounds like I think everybody's on record is not supporting this. So this would be a unanimous voting this down. Would that then leave the petitioner the option to reapply or to go through appeal? Or do we, was it better to make a motion for redesign? Through the chair, Mr. Mulcahy, if the commission returns this for redesign, the applicant can come back when they have uh, 
addressed the issues of the commission and bring a revised plan to you uh, at no cost in terms of fees. If you reject, deny this conditional use request, their options are to A, appeal, B, submit a new request with a new fee, or, you know, find some other completely different thing to do. Thank you. What is the fee? I believe it's, oh, Francis has it right here. $6,000. All right, uh, Commissioner Robinson. Um, if I may, I'd like to make a motion to uh, uh, return the, the case for redesign. Um, I, I, I don't think you can do that. I, I, uh, I, I need some uh, advice here. We have a current motion on the floor. Ms. McConnell. Madam Chair, my understanding is that Mr. Robinson would actually like a postponement Correct. with the applicant to come back and redesign the site plan to address X, Y, and Z issues. That is correct. And a postponement can be, uh, the, a motion for a postponement can be made at any time. Okay. All right. And that's what you're doing? Uh, Commissioner Robinson? Th that's what I'm putting out there, yes. All right. All right. So do we have a second to that motion? Uh, that's seconded by Commissioner Ferguson. Um, so uh, we need to vote on that motion? I'd like to speak to the motion first. All right. M my specific concerns, and I think the concerns of most of this body, have to do, first of all, with drainage, that the drainage is not clear, what you're proposing may work, but we'd like to see a legible drawing that shows that so that we've got some confidence that it will work. The second point is the view shed or the appearance from uh, the, their, their house. And I would like to see a rendering or something showing what you could do. And what I'm seeing is some terraces, a berm, and landscaping. So there's some, there's some effort on the gravel there, but I don't think there's a heck of a lot. And if, if you could answer those questions, I think you've got a better chance to get through this body. And um, I think we, it's up to us to clarify what, what our expectations are. But most of the concerns that I heard up here tonight were in those two areas. OK, um, let's vote. And please use your voting machines. This is a motion to postpone. No. <laughs> Use the thumbs. That motion fails. All right, we're back to the main motion. Commissioner Parks, would you repeat your motion? Yes, Madam Chair, a motion to approve uh, case number, um, it's 2013-123, uh, uh, the Matanuska Electric Association for Conditional Use. And that motion is seconded by Commissioner Ferguson. No. No? No. I apologize. Uh, Commissioner Mulcahy. Commissioner Mulcahy. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, you have already spoken to your motion. Is there any more discussion by anyone? All right. Please use your voting machines. That motion is unanimous. Um, that motion fails. Thank you. Madam Chair, the screens aren't on, so maybe you can explain the two votes. I just realized that. All right. Um, well, the motion to approve by Commissioner Parks and Mr. Mulcahy 
failed unanimously, and the motion to postpone failed with a vote of three and three. Okay. Any other questions? Um, would you? Um, all right. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have a, an appearance request uh, by Ron Oliva, uh, the brother of Francis Shelter, conditional use. Uh, Ms. McConnell, as I understand it, uh, appearance requests are limited to five minutes. Is that accurate? That is correct. All right. Thank you. Mr. Oliva. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Ron Oliva. I am an auctioneer, but I'll try not to speak uh, fast, even though five minutes wouldn't cover the issue. I hope you all did receive a packet, and I really sincerely hope you looked at it and studied it, because uh, I'm asking for three things tonight. The first request is in reference to requiring a public hearing in regard to the conditional use approval for the following, which was supposed to be addressed in an, a two-year report. And if you recall, at the last planning and zoning uh, commission meeting, you approved that resolution accepting that report. Well, when you accepted it, on that night, I handed Susan Bomolonsky a copy of the lawsuit because her report to this commission didn't have an iota of truth in it. And it, it was basically she danced here like she had drank five gallons of water to the issues that needed to be addressed, especially in the three issues of the off-site impacts to the community, the transit and crosswalk pedestrian concerns, and the weekly nearby uh, roads and property, the pickup of garbage. I have to tell you, uh, I think uh, Commissioner Robinson, um, about the 50-foot distance between heavy industrial and R6, I'm adjacent to the Brother Francis shelter. That zoning is going to be for a mono landfill of some nature. I'm a neighbor to CEI at their facility, and I'm familiar with the landfill at O'Highland and the roads into that are cleaner than the Third Avenue by the Brother Francis Shelter at any day of the week. And I mean the garbage is so substantial and the fecal material, it's just recently been addressed by the health department. The off-site impacts, as you can see, my property assessment was appealed, and as you saw in the packet, that due to the stigma of the Brother Francis Shelter and Beans Cafe, they reduced the assessment $92,000. I appealed my other properties when I appeared with the bottles, and those were only the plastic bottles, and put them on my fence, almost 2,000 of them. I appealed those property values. And I have to tell you, I did a $1.2 million auction, brought 960 registered bidders to the sale. A mini convention of hairdressers couldn't do that for the economy. But to stay focused on the assessment at the Board of Adjustment, I couldn't get the property values reduced because they didn't have a comparable and they're the lowest assessed properties in the city. So if there is a negative impact, it's economic, it's safety, it's health, and believe me, it's the quiet enjoyment of my property. And I, I pay taxes on it. I lived there with my five children for 13 years, and I'm moving off. 
because not once have they ever addressed that the lifeboat is full. And not once have they cured the transit and crosswalk pedestrian concerns because there isn't a signal crosswalk from Reeve Boulevard all the way to Cordova. And I believe they're also in violation because the overflow goes to Beans Cafe. And these two work in conjunction. So that overflow is an extension of the conditional use that has not been approved by this commission. So how much time do I have left? One minute. One minute, okay. Well, a as you can see, I, I did offer solutions. I, and believe me, I appeared before every committee, commission, the mayor, and I sued them. I sued them, and during the mediation, I took on five attorneys as a layman. And I didn't want the money. I wanted them to address the issues. And it ended up $30,000. I took it back to the assembly, never cashed the checks, and offered to give it back if they would get the Rasmussen Foundation or someone to match it and get some porta potties, dollars for dogs, or uh, some security issues. And I think that's the biggest issue if you look at. I want to say that they've had over, from the fire department to date, just this year, 928 calls. And they, in the area, uh, I believe there was 959 to the Brother Francis shelter by the police department. And within a 2,000 foot radius of the shelter in Beans, there was a total of 2,722 calls. And that's just to August. Over the last five years, there's been, including that August figure, almost 15,000 calls. Now, how can you do business or live in that environment? And they're protected by a moral veil. If you said to the last petitioner, developers have to follow the same rules or nonprofits have to follow the same rules as a private developer, why am I there on heavy industrial property next to a homeless shelter that has a conditional use and you don't do anything to restrict that. And just as a final comment, uh, Commissioner, uh, when you had this last meeting, Commissioner Jones, she actually stated the whole purpose of a conditional use is to grant a use not normally allowed in a particular use district with certain conditions that will make it acceptable use to the surrounding neighborhood. This has been a failure. It's not Brother Francis Shelter, BFS. It's Big Failure Shelter. And you have to make amends. Thank you very much for your testimony. Commissioner Pruz has a question for you. I have a question to staff. Uh, whether it's this, this issue or any other issue, when it comes to actual implementation of the conditional use and, and uh, following the uh, what the permit says what what is the department's process uh, of, with complaints to those that do not follow the like the conditional use permit um, through the chair uh, uh, mr. Pruse uh, the zoning code enforcement um, office is responsible for um, taking in complaints uh, for uh, not complying with the zoning code enforcement or with the with the conditional use or with the, the zoning rules in place and um, working it out with the uh, with the property owner to bring them into compliance has, has that happened in this case um, no it hasn't. well to, to my understanding is that there have been no complaints um, there's no complaints in the file there's the the only complainant um, is Mr. Aleva, and I don't think that, well, I haven't checked with code enforcement to see if any uh, cases have been opened up. Um, there's a memorandum of understanding between um, Brother Francis Shelter and the Fairview Community Council, and they have a dispute resolution process set up, 
and that's only been invoked once, and that was with a complaint initiated by Mr. Leva, but there haven't been any um, this year. So, so a complaint by an individual landowner adjacent to a condition you shall permit E has to go through the community council? Is that before it's investigated? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, so this Brother Francis shelter has sort of a, a unique um, sort of requirement that there's this alternative dispute resolution process with the community council. But whenever um, a property owner is out of compliance with their conditional use or with any of the land use laws that we have, um, a complaint can be registered with uh, zoning code uh, enforcement. Uh, there's a hotline to make those, kind, those kinds of complaints. Mr. Oliva, have you, have you complained to code enforcement? Mr. Pews, I have complained to everyone from the senator down to the board of uh, the Brother Francis Shelter. But what he referenced was questioned by Chairman Jones of validity. The memorandum of understanding with the Fairview Community Council, that was part of the a report, if you read it from Dr. Shermard, uh, it didn't even come close to mitigating any of the complaints that I voiced, but also member, other members of the community. And a memorandum of understanding is not enforceable. That's why that dribble that Susan Bomolansky gave you, uh, it, it didn't hold any weight because no one could sue her for not presenting all the facts. Oh, and what you really need you, you is a memorandum of agreement. That's a legally binding document. Okay, so you have complained to code enforcement. I have complained to code enforcement, especially on the garbage. Okay. And what okay. happened with the code enforcement officer, she followed one of their the garbage pickup people with their bag and photographed them taking the bag into the woods and sitting there for about an hour and then returning it, doing nothing. I'm just trying to get to what, how the process works. So, so obviously there's been a complaint, but, but you're saying the file's empty? Yes. Mr. Prince, if I could clarify, code enforcement complaints are generally not filed within the planning conditional use files. So code enforcement would work to resolve, they work to resolve, the, their initial desire is to resolve the issue with the uh, violator, the alleged violator, and um, only at such time that they cannot get the issue resolved do they then move towards a um, enforcement process where there may be uh, fines and hearings before the hearing officer. Well, I'd, I'd just like to make a couple comments. First is, is you know, I travel, I travel through that area many times a day, and I will, I will uh, confirm that the, the transit crosswalk pedestrian is concerned. It's almost getting to be, the, for them, a, like a Russian roulette. Um, they, there's a flashing yellow light. I think they seem to think it's a right away for them on the, uh, for, for people to walk. I've noticed lately that now they're actually taunting vehicles as they cross. Um, I don't know if they're sober or not, um, but, but uh, it is I've, I'm, probably the next last 60 days I've, I've noticed it. I don't have to do with the heat we've had or just, just, just what it is. I'll also, I'll also confirm that uh, the trash is pretty obnoxious and I've seen uh, in certain areas on it, um, but I, you know, I'm at a loss for the solution I, I, I would think that if there was complaints, that the complaints would be addressed. And obviously, if there was no, if, there, if the, uh, the condition of use was not being, permit was not being adhered to, at some point the city would say something, or I don't know if it comes back to this commission. Uh, but as a short timer on this board, um, it is a problem. Uh, and for some reason, we seem to be putting our head in the sand because I haven't seen any changes in the 15 years. Uh, my, my business has been down there. Uh, I don't know what the solution is. That's why I asked about code enforcement. Um, I will also say that uh, at some point, um, someone will get hurt on the road. It's a matter of time. Um, it won't be intentional, obviously, but uh, uh, when there, there, there typically is not a, the police or the, or these 
fire department is usually not very far away, so they will be on site momentarily. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate that uh, testimony. Commissioner Ferguson. Um, one, I agree with everything that Dana said. And I, I think it's tragic that no one has addressed this. So I've got a couple questions. First of all, the staff, what are our options with this? Anything? Over the above. To the chair, Mr. Ferguson. The code states that a conditional use can be modified only upon application by the petitioner. That allows for businesses, developments, people who are required to get conditional uses to have some certainty as to their approval and moving forward. Um, certainly the uh, Brother Francis Shelter should be in compliance with their existing conditional use, or rather uh, the most recent amendment to their conditional use, which was granted in 2003. Reporting requirements were placed upon them, um, and their next reporting period comes before you next June. It's a very difficult situation, and I think everybody, um, you know, has heard of issues and has experienced issues all over town and I don't have an answer for you other than it would not be lawful to open a conditional use uh, development that is in compliance with uh, the standards that were or the conditions that were placed upon it at the time the conditional use was granted. That seems sincerely in doubt whether they are in compliance or not. Um, part of my questioning is on that. Just, just you're, 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 you're losing your own argument right now, sir. So just be patient for a minute. You have our attention. We're trying to work with it. Don't try to detract with it. I mean, I'm concerned with the monofill creating the same sort of a deal down the road. So I, I'm really interested in trying to resolve this. Um, would it be within our purview to send this report to the assembly, asking them that they look into it and take some action? Would that be appropriate? Is there any basis before that? The assembly has no authority over conditional uses. Except, I mean, in, in the sense that, that the authority of the commission comes from the assembly through their ability to uh, modify Title 21. And I, I know that, well, I suspect you're all aware of situations where the assembly has passed an ordinance with a notwithstanding the requirement for the commission to review this, we're not sending it to the commission for a review. So technically, um, I don't know, I, I probably shouldn't say this without a legal opinion, but technically it seems like the assembly has a lot of leeway to kind of do whatever they want. Um, as I understood you correctly, uh, Erica, the uh, Brother Francis Shelter is up for its review uh, with the conditional use next June. Yeah, is that correct? Madam Chair, it, it's... It's not technically a conditional use review. If you have um, resolution 2003-010 before you, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have it, but no. let me read. The last condition says, Brother Francis Shelter shall provide a status report to the Planning and Zoning Commission within two years from the date of this conditional use approval on the following items. A, off-site impacts to the community, B, transit and crosswalk pedestrian concerns. C, weekly patrols of nearby road and property trash patrols shall continue. So you're going to get a status report on those issues uh, next June, but the um, specific reading of that condition does not say the conditional use is reopened. You can revise it, change it. And, um, and, and I would just like to state, I have no opinion on whether or not they meet the terms of their conditional use. I, I don't have enough information to have an opinion about that. And the conditional use runs with the property, 
Is that my understanding correctly? That's, that's correct. All right. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Pruse. A is, com is, oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. To the chair. Has there ever been a conditional use permit hold? And if so, what were the conditions or how did that happen? If someone wasn't in compliance with it? Conditional uses, um, they, they expire if the um, conditional use is abandoned for a period of one year or longer, or if the property owner notifies the commission that they are choosing to abandon it. Um, I can't think of any time when a conditional use has been revoked without meeting either of those two um, uh, conditions, but I, I don't have the whole history of the Muni in my knowledge. So, so if they don't adhere to the conditions in the in the permit, they st they, there is no real ramifications to the to the uh, holder permit holder. Well, eventually, the um, you know, should they not cooperate with code enforcement, they would get taken before a hearing officer, um, who would determine. Uh, penalties, I guess. I, I, I'm not. I'm not really. I don't have an, an example of a situation, but of, of where a conditional use has a violation of a conditional use has gone all the way to a hearing officer. Uh, all right. So um, I guess what I'm going to ask you, Erica, is to do a little bit of research and so to provide this commission um, uh, a little history uh, about conditional uses and under what terms and conditions um, things uh, can change on a conditional use. Yes, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Oliva. Uh, 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 Connie, th this, this point about conditional uses, if Sand Lake had a conditional use at a pit and dirt fell on the street and they didn't clean it up, they'd shut down the pit. A bar that had violations Mr. would be, Aliva, would be shut down. Thank you for your testimony. Well, no, you are I'm finished with your no, testimony. Not, yes, you are. I'm not finished. Yes, you are, because Mr. Aliva. You, you are finished. We are moving on. Ability to take action according to the chair. If I follow these rules, if you set up these rules, why don't you? I believe that is correct. All right. So um, I think what we should say, since we're 
in this sort of reorganizational period, so to speak, uh, with potential new members, that we will not have a meeting on October 14th. Hi, are you out on the 7th? Well, I can, uh, you mean on the 4th? No, on the 7th of October. No, I am here on October 7th. Okay. All right. All right, so. The projectors come on. All right, so. If, if just bear with us here, thank you. Um, November 4th, I will make plans to be here. I will be here on November, I will be here on November 4th. I will not be here on November 7th, Erica. So if you'd like to have a director's meeting, um, uh, we should poll the commission. If you would like to have one, that's perfectly fine. Um, I will be in Hawaii, so. <laughs> Are you hosting that in there? Huh? Yeah, hosting. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll stay an extra month. All right. Then we have a holiday on the 11th, and we will theoretically have a meeting on the 18th. Do you want to have a director's meeting on the 7th? Uh, Robinson, Ferguson, Mulcahy. Well, he's yes. Asked on all of them, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. So, Erica, yes, you will have a meeting on November 7th, a director's meeting. Uh, you will, we will have a director's meeting on October 3rd as well. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything else before the commission at this time? Move the punt. All right. May I would entertain a motion for adjournment, Commissioner Park. So moved. Thank you. Seconded by Dana Cruz. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.